He's the young and beardless reality star of Duck Dynasty. What about these bongos? I forgot about these. You think those are really essential? John Lake. John Lake. They are essential. John Luke Robertson shares when his real life adventure began on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to 700 Club Interactive. You, you know him as the fun-loving oldest son of Willie and Corey Robertson on Duck Dynasty. Well, John Luke Robertson joins us today with his new wife, Mary Kate. And for those of you who haven't been swept up in this famous family's phenomenal hit show, here's a look at the young and beardless Robertson. You would think that this beardless member of the famous Duck Dynasty clan would follow in his family's footsteps. John Luke and Mary Kate will be heading off to college soon, so Cy and I decided to come over and help them pack. What is that thing behind you? It's a paddle board. What's it good for? That defines who he is. This is who I am. No. Yeah. No. John Luke Robertson, the oldest son of Willie and Corey Robertson, headed off to college to figure out his own dreams and goals. In his book, Young and Beardless, he shares wild stories of the Robertson escapades and how lessons from home set him on the right path toward dominating his future. Well, welcome to the show, cousins. It's good to have you yeah. here. It's nice to, nice to see you in person. It is Thanks great to be us. here. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your love story. I understand you met at camp. We did. And then you shared chemistry class together, mm -hmm. and there seems to be some chemistry. There is. But then I understand there was a text message involved. What was that? There was whenever, so I liked her. She didn't particularly like me the same way that I liked her. <laughs> and at some point. Is that true or is she just hiding it? Well, I mean, I kind of liked it a little bit. I, know, but but <laughs> I knew she did. I knew she did. She just wouldn't admit it. And at some point uh, I got a text that said, that you did like me. You want to talk? I'm, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I'm sure it is. Yeah. yeah. And so I came home, and that's when we had our talk. And then Mary Kate said that she had never dated anyone, and she didn't want to date anyone until she found the one that she would marry, mm -hmm. and that she would date me. And I thought, wow, all right, well, we're getting married then. <laughs> <laughs> and from the first meeting. From there. And wow. then, that's what nine months after that, I proposed. And then nine months after that, we got married. Well, what do you say to people who say you're too young? I think uh, we have seen, in our, just in our family, we've seen, my parents got married at 19, 18. Their marriage is working out pretty well. Yeah. Her parents got married at 39, 32. Mm -hmm. So total opposite of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Their marriage is working out pretty well. And we've also had people, in our, even in our own family, who got married young, whose marriage ended in divorce. And, you got married old and it's marriage ended in divorce. And so we'd like to say like, we've seen you know everything and whatever it is that is keeping marriages together, it's not when the marriage happens, mm -hmm. it's based on something else. And we believe that's based on God and that's what our marriage is based on. So we think it's gonna work. Well, you're gonna get the privilege of raising each other. I mean, exactly. It's be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. You're gonna and get to together lot, find out who you are. And it's a lot more fun than and dating. You know, <laughs> and, and you get to have kids, you get to have that, that whole discovery, that changes everything. Yeah. Uh, and so take your time with that. What, what did your parents say when they found out? Um, I think that, well, I, like Jolene said, like I hadn't dated anyone. I had been just kind of like holding off and like I'd kind of told God, like, I know that you have like someone out there for me and I don't want to settle like for anything less than that. And so my parents had seen me like stay single and like remain single. And so I think they already expected like whoever Mary Kate like chooses to start dating, like I feel like so that'll be it's the gonna one. work out. It's yeah. gonna that's gonna be the one. And so I think they were already kind of preparing for that. And mm -hmm. so when Jolly came around, why did you resolve to do that? That's actually very unusual today. Well, my dad was actually my like youth group teacher, and mm -hmm. there was this whole lesson that he taught on, and it was called "God gives his best to those who leave the choice with him." And so for me, I was just at the age where, like in high school, it was somewhere junior high, high school, but I was at the age where 
that was like a big thing. Dating was like all my friends were dating. And that was just the time when I was like, I'm going to apply this, this concept to my like dating world. And so just yeah. what happened. And it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> it did. It did. And it's great. You've got a book out, Young and, and, and Beardless, mm -hmm. uh, and I just like to remind people that you're the New Testament version of a Robertson. <laughs> um, you know, that Old Testament stuff has all gone away. You've uh -huh. got the New Covenant. <laughs> um, Amen to that. How in the world do you find time to do this? I mean, you're writing your book, you're starting a business, you're going to college, you're getting mm -hmm. married, you're doing a lot of things, mm -hmm. and, and you can say each one of them could take your full attention. Yeah. But here you are coming out with a book. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get the time to do it? Uh, it was a long process. I mean, it was probably two years of, you know, thinking and planning about it and writing it, and I had lots of help. And, uh, you know, it wasn't easy. There were lots of late nights and early mornings, and it was just prioritizing and getting things done and making lists and just doing it. I mean, What, I what started it? It a started. Two-year process. That's, that's a long one to stick with it for that period of time. Right. That's a big deal. So mm -hmm. what, what motivated you? It started, it really started way back when I was 14. And a mentor of mine told me to write down everything that I hear, everything that inspires me. So I did for, so pretty much every sermon I ever heard or anything that inspired me for, you know, six years, I wrote it down. And then until I had just a really big box. So writing the book, it came a lot from that box. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it wasn't, necessarily hard because I wasn't starting from scratch. I just took all that and condensed it. And then I lived it for a year and then wrote about it as I lived it. So like starting the business, getting married, um, all of those things I wrote about them as they were happening. So it wasn't that like writing the book and business, school, life, everything was separate. They were kind of one and the same. I was writing about it as I was living it. Uh, you, you call it the toolkit. But mm -hmm. these are things that you, you've put away. And then, you know, a lot of toolkits like mine is, sits in the garage. <laughs> and, you know, when things are broken, I bring it out. Right. But you're saying use it every day. Use it in, right. in, in what you do and, and live purposefully. Right. Uh, well, for you, what, what, are you, what are the major tools you go to every day? Uh, I think there's a few things I have that I really, that run through my mind every day. You know, a few verses like, there's that verse in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 11, maybe 12, and it talks about, um, remember the Creator in the days of your youth, and for everything you will be judged. So I think about that, and like before I do really anything, I think, okay, like I'm young and God wants me to live a full life, but also you gotta remember that He's judging me for whatever I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I think about that. Another thing I keep in mind is, uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is a book that I constantly try to think of, okay, like listen first. I try to think like, make sure I get my rest. And I think of those. So those are some of the things that I have in my toolkit that I'll, I try to think about and live out daily. Ecclesiastes, that's a deep dive. I, I didn't get in that until my, my, I was in my 30s. Uh, <laughs> so if you're living your life now according to that, you're, you're, you're being very purposeful. Mm -hmm. well, what's, what's the dream? What are, you, what are you trying to achieve? That is an interesting question because the entire book is about accomplishing the dream. Uh, and I think that two years ago, I would have given you get married, start a business, go to college. I would have given you a big list and a good plan on how I was going to plan on doing it. Um, but now, two years later, I'm kind of in the starting over phase, mm -hmm. you know, because I've accomplished a lot of things. And I've failed at a lot of things that I wanted to do. So right now, the big dream is just, is not anything specific, but it's just to love Mary Kate, have a good marriage, be good at school and go and live life. Okay. And I'm formula, I'm starting over. I'm starting a new toolkit. I'm starting a new adventure. And that's part of life, mm -hmm. that you get to start over. You get right. to, uh, and the great thing is you're starting out young. What, what you're doing is building a platform so that when you dream again, mm -hmm. you're starting at a whole different level. Right. Uh, and you're starting at a level, yes, failures, but also successes. Mm -hmm. And what can, what can you build on? What can you dream of again? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I think that's a life lesson for everybody. Yeah. Uh, for me, I've started over a couple times. <laughs> and, and each one, okay, how can I dream bigger? Because mm -hmm. uh, God's a big God. Yeah. Uh, and what does he want to do? And can I be part of his plan? Mm -hmm. uh, not my plan, not what I want to do, but right. can I be part of his plan? Mm -hmm. uh, and and when, you, when you put those things into perspective, boy, it gets really easy. Yeah. What's your dream? I think right now my dream is still just like we're in our first year of marriage and just making our marriage like the best it can be and like being the best wife I can be and just seeing like just kind of walking with God daily right now and just seeing what He wants me to do and like what He has in store for me. What's your major? I'm in women's leadership. That's a good major for you. I really <laughs> like it a lot. I do. <laughs> I, think, I think you're going to go far. I think Thank it's going to be great. It's great to see people start with purpose, uh, live life with purpose. If you want to get your own toolkit, uh, and if you're looking for that perfect graduation gift, uh, look no further. John Luke's book is called Young and Beardless, and it's available wherever books are sold. And it's wonderful having you with us. And it's come back again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks right. for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay. Well, coming up, hope for the invisible victims of sex trafficking. There are no safe homes for boys. There needs to be someone to step up and do a safe home for boys. See how this former victim of trafficking is stepping up along with her husband. Up to 300,000 underage girls are sold for sex every year in America. Now men and boys are also targets for sex traffickers and help for them can be very scarce. Now one couple in North Carolina is planning to open the first safe house in the U.S. that is just for boys who have been victims of sex trafficking. Charlene Aron shows us the Anchor House. Each year, more than 300,000 U.S. children face the risk of sexual exploitation, lured with the promise of money, shelter, or attention. Each year, a pimp can exploit an average of four to six girls, usually between the ages of 12 and 14, and make from $150 to $200,000 per child. Rescue efforts tend to focus on girls, leaving boys as invisible victims in the sex industry. A study by the John Jay School of Criminal Justice found that young males made up nearly half of commercially exploited children in New York City. Until recently, no long-term recovery safe homes existed within the United States for boys. That changed thanks to Chris and Anna Smith. They began a ministry called Restore One, with initial plans to open a home for sex-trafficked girls. Anna, once a victim herself, had interned at a safe house for girls. Then they heard of the growing, unmet need to help boys. It was a panel of survivors um, talking about their programs and talking about, um, you know, just the need and, and the things that the people they were working with were walking through. And one, one stood up and started to say, like, I have boys coming to my drop-in center all the time. And um, there are no safe homes for boys. There needs to be someone to step up and do a safe home for boys. At that moment, Chris and I turned around, just like looked at each other. The Smiths answered that need with the Anchor House, a first of its kind shelter aimed at providing refuge and restoration for adolescent boys. We're a long-term care facility, um, restorative care facility, and our goal is, is to give that boy, um, as best as we can, um, a life that he deserves. So here at the Anchor House, you know, be, be counseling, and there's a library, um, there's a game room, um, we have a cafeteria, a living room. So our goal is, is if to think about your, your boy or your girl, whatever they're involved in, that's our goal. So homeschooling, um, to, to get them caught back up in school, um, so our goal is to provide every um, care uh, that we can for them to get them back on their feet. Anna fears that the number of boys trapped in this miserable existence is greater than people might think. Our culture does not allow space for men to experience um, any type of harm. A man cannot be a victim. Men are perpetrators. The project took only six months to complete, a task many believed impossible. 
The Anchor House sits on 10 acres of land, and while the owners have received a ton of support from the community, there are some who don't think the safe house is a good idea. Anna and I have been uh, yelled at and called names and wrote about on all over social media. I'm not going to say that it, that was easy to walk through. We pray for them and, you know, we do love them and um, maybe they don't see it today. Um, but God is good and his grace extends further than we could ever imagine. Director Linda Royster, a licensed counselor, is aware that many of the boys who come here will need extensive healing. To be violated perpetually. It may be hard for you and I to wrap our minds around that, but then these boys will come to us, these residents will come to us with a long history of abuse. While the Anchor House is Christ-centered, any boy needing help will be welcomed. We have a stance that we're not gonna, we're not gonna force Christianity or the Christian faith upon anyone, but we're gonna let them know what it's like to feel the impact of it. The Anchor House is set to open in January 2017. Until then, the Smiths look forward to giving the boys a home that helps them overcome their past to live free and fulfilled lives. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, the Smiths say God told them to build the Anchor House debt free, and they're depending on do donations from the public. And if you would like to find out how you can help, you can go to their website, restoreonelife.org. Uh, RestoreOneLife.org. Well, every day, CBN's Orphan's Promise provides safe homes for thousands of children around the world, like these two brothers from Vietnam. At the ages of four and one, they had to beg for food on the side of the road. Loam was four years old and Vaughn was one when their parents abandoned them near their home in Vietnam. We were so hungry. I carried my brother to my aunt's house to ask for food, but she didn't let us in. The brothers sat next to the street, hoping that someone would see them and help them. Vaughn was crying so hard because he was starving. I couldn't do anything to help him. Another aunt found them and took them in, but over time she wasn't able to provide for them either. There was a time when we didn't have food to eat for two days. My stomach hurt a lot. Eventually, the brothers came to live here at this Christian home supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. The food here is so good, and we get to eat three times a day. On our first day here, they also gave us clothes and new towel. In addition to food and shelter, the boys are also experiencing love. Today, Loam and Vaughn are healthy and active boys. They both do well in school and enjoy playing with their friends. I want to thank the people who care for us and help us. And CBN. Thank you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that blessing. You're part of that help to those wonderful little boys. If you're not a member, join with us. All you have to do is call us, 888-777-1999, or you can log on to 700clubinteractive.com. How much is it to join? It's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. And when you call and join, we've got something for you. It's my father's latest teaching. It's called Victory Through Life Storms. If you're going through a storm, this will help you and give you biblical principles as well as life lessons from my father, who's certainly been through his fair share of life storms, uh, fair share of successes and also failures. And he gives us his wisdom at 86 years old of how to obtain victory through life storms. So if you want it, uh, just call us 888-777-1999 and say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. And if you want to designate a gift to Orphan's Promise, it's real easy. All you have to do is say, I want to do that when you call. Uh, just say, I want to give this to Orphan's Promise. There's also a place on the giving page on the website uh, where you can designate. Either way, do it now. 888-777-1999. Well, still ahead, how do you respond to hard times? When my daughter got sick, I had to make the decision. Am I going to take the bait of Satan 
that wants to lure me to offense and bitterness, or am I gonna accept the invitation from heaven that will allow me to get better? Chad Veach shares why we don't have to take the bait. Stay with us. Four years ago, doctors told Pastor Chad Veach that his daughter Georgia would never walk or talk. So Chad had a decision to make. He could become bitter or better. When I was growing up, one of my favorite things to do was go fishing with my dad. My favorite part of fishing, though, if I'm being honest, it was never the fishing part. It was always stopping at this little fishing equipment store place that we'd stop at. And dad would go get all the bait that we needed. And my brother and I, we'd go get all the snacks. Dad would explain the different types of, of baits that we were going to use to catch different types of fishes. You know, I believe that Satan always uses bait to lure you into a path of destruction. The bait of Satan is out there to, as John 10, 10 says, to steal you and to kill you, and I hate to be graphic, but to destroy you. That's the bait of Satan. But the invitation from heaven is always to bring you into betterness. This is God. This is the message of hope. This is the gospel. You know, I'm thinking about the life of Job. Job experiences the, the hashtag worst day ever. He gets sick, he loses his kids, he loses his reputation, and all this stuff goes bad. And even his own spouse, you know, his wife, the one that's supposed to stand with you and rich and, and, and poor and sickness and health, even his own wife comes to him and she says, Job, please tell me we're not going to church this Sunday. We're not gonna keep praising your God. Job made a decision, I'm not going down this path of bitterness. I'm not going to get angry at God and frustrated at God. Job says things in his resolve like, even if he slays me, I'm going to praise him. I know my Redeemer lives. Job had this resolve to say, I'm going to get better from my circumstance. I'm refusing to get bitter. What about you? What about what you're going through? I believe with all my heart that you can get better through your circumstance. You can actually get stronger. You can get wiser. You can get healthier. You can get happier. And I'm not preaching to you out of theory, I'm actually talking to you out of my own life. You know, I've experienced a lot of tragedy. Many of you uh, might know our story, my wife and I. We've got a sick daughter. One of my daughter got sick, and that was, you know, four years ago. We still face it today. I had to make the decision. Am I gonna take the bait of Satan that wants to lure me to offense and bitterness, or am I gonna accept the invitation from heaven that will allow me to get better? I can tell you four years later, we are not bitter but we are better. We're stronger, we're a little softer, we're a little bit more aware of other people's struggles, and it's only because we heard heaven say, if you'll allow me to, I can actually make you overcome through your tragedy. I'm inviting you to do the same today. Reject the bait of Satan. Say yes to the invitation of heaven. Say yes to his invitation. Look at struggles in life as an opportunity, not as some horrible disaster, oh, woe is me, but as an opportunity. And that temptation that we have, and the book of Job spells it out as, as graphically as it can, uh, Job's wife coming to him, you know, curse God and die. But he said, no, I'm not going to do that. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He, uh, he, he didn't give in to that. And at the end of it, he asks God, he, he wants to argue his case. What have I done wrong? Uh, and God appears to him. Now, Jesus echoes this in the Sermon of the Mount. And, and that, that sermon, we really need to pay attention to. It's been called the Constitution of the Kingdom of Heaven. He leads it out with, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So you're blessed because you're going to see God, but how do you maintain that purity? And that's not some kind of purity that says, well, it's absence of lust, or um, you're, you're not trying to pursue, you're not greedy for money. That's not the purity is talking about. That Greek word, katharos, means there's nothing adulterating. There is no contaminant in it. The Bible again and again talks about bitterness in our heart. And in that bitterness, all kinds of evil start to grow. And in that purity of heart with no bitterness, 
that you're filled with love, you're filled with expectation of what God is going to do, how he's going to be victorious in this, in this situation, no matter how bad it seems, he's able to turn it around. He's able to turn your mess into a ministry, your test into a testimony. He's able to do that for you if you just allow him. So look for that purity, that purity of heart, that no matter what comes, I'm going to bless God. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And when you show that and you show your love for him, well, that's when you get to see God. That's when you get to see him in all his majesty. This happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed. If you need help in prayer, call us 888 888- 777-1999. We leave you with a verse from Job, but he knows where I am going. And when he tests me, I will come out as pure as gold. God bless you. We'll see you again.